everybody, really, really everybody, think that he or she, him or herself, is very ethical. But still, there are quite some ethical scandals going on, so probably that's not completely true. We're not all so ethical. So we are sometimes a bit fraudulous. We are sometimes doing harm to people. And therefore, we probably need some guidelines. At least we need a few lectures about it. Let's think about ethics. And according to Hammersley and Atkinson in 2007, and earlier they written this before as well, um, there are five focal points or five headings under which we can look at ethics. And the first is informed consent versus passive deception, privacy, do no harm, exploitation, and the last one, consequences for future research. And I would like to discuss uh, these focal points using a single example of a more laboratory focused research. Uh, and it's a research about how do people interact with dogs? Well, informed consent, what is this? Well, informed consent originated in the more medical sciences, in psychology, uh, but has invaded the idea of informed consent, has invaded social science in general uh, a little more the last few decades. And informed consent means that you give someone explanation about what the research is about. So you inform people and then people have to sign it. And they have to sign it in order that they show that they understand it. And some critics on informed consent would say that in the last decade, last few decades, this informed consent has transferred from giving agency to the people under study to giving power um, to universities. Why? Because it's not so much about the inform information bit anymore among quite some researchers. It's more about the consent. If people sign the contract, you can do anything you like. So that's the, the, the nasty bit about informed consent. The other side is passive deception. You do not give any form. You do not give any information. And we call this passive deception. Why? Well, you don't tell people, for instance, when you're doing a research on a festival, you don't tell, hello, I'm the researcher. I'm looking at all you 10,000 people. Please sign a form. You can't do that. So you're just there and you're looking at the festival and you see how people dance or use drugs or eat and have fun or whatever you, your research topic is about. So you simply watch. And we can discuss, and you can discuss, whether we need informed consent always, or we need passive deception, or we need a combination, or it depends on the research question. So this is one focal point and one point of discussion, actually. Do we need informed consent? Do we need passive deception? And in some countries, you have to use informed consent. Among some universities, you have to use informed consent. Among some others, you can use forms of passive deception, which is not per se negative. A second focal point is privacy. And I think we, in general, agree that if you do a research about someone with a dog, it's not so nice if you stand there and, and videotape it and then broadcast it on YouTube or on Coursera or anywhere you invade someone's privacy. And we earlier discussed the tea room trade in which people were interviewed after having impersonal sex in public places or semi-public places in public restrooms. And after that, they were interviewed. And well, this was some kind of invasion in the privacy, but it wasn't made public. So the names weren't published. Um, but in, in this case, well, this person is pretty traceable, um, especially with the hairstyle, everyone will notice him. So um, you see he's making a fool out of himself, but it's broadcasted. And that's a terrible thing generally in, from an ethical point of view. You don't invade in someone's privacy that much. You also do not do any harm. And it's related, of course, to the privacy aspect or it's related to the informed consent. So not physical harm, but also psychological harm or any other harm. It's a focal point 
and still we can discuss. Sometimes we do a little harm. Sometimes we interview people about very sensitive topics and after the interview they do not feel great. So how do we deal with that? Is it science for everything or is it the person we interview for everything? Another one is exploitation. As researchers, even if you don't pay, usually you exploit a bit. You interview people and you don't pay them. You give them a nice time, an, a nice interview. You're nice and kind to them. But in the end, you are the one who's grabbing something, information, data. And so in some ways you are using respondents, you are using informants, and you are using poorer people uh, that want to have five euros, so therefore they join your research and they end up being bitten by a dog. And the last bit, last focal point is the consequences for future research. It's really cool if you do a really nice research on a festival, uh, but if your behavior was pretty unethical, if your behavior was uh, invading privacy of people and then exploiting people or showing uh, the data not anonymously, showing information about specific person and then you start publishing it, then these people at the festival won't let any other researcher to join uh, to do some research there. So it's very nice for your own pioneering research, but probably the rest of science can't do anything anymore in that field because the people say, not anymore. So there are consequences for future research. And we tend to focus on all these aspects, on, uh, on all these focal points of ethics uh, from the point of a researcher as well as the researched. But actually it's way more complex because if we look at research, we often have researchers themselves in a personal network. For instance, a colleague did research um, uh, in, in massage parlors where other things happened as well. But the partner of that researcher didn't really like it if he went in that, that, that parlor to have a massage and, well, at least the offer of something more. So the personal network should like it. The personal network shouldn't be harmed. Um, and what about fellow researchers? Do you pose any harm to fellow researchers because you are doing your research in a certain area in a certain way? Do you pose threats to science? You, are, you, you do not only have a, a responsibility to do research, to your personal network, to your fellow researchers, but to science in general. And what about the law? What about if you do an ethnographic study on, um, uh, on, on street boys? who happened to steal a wallet of one of your colleagues. What do you do? Do you go to the police? Or do you help your research participant? To who are you ethical? So there's an issue. And another issue is the funders. Because funders sometimes want a certain type of conclusion and you can't give them because of ethics, because of science. So. It's way more complex than just these five focal points. And thinking about the harm, thinking about the privacy, thinking about the exploitation, to whom, not just to whom, but also now. Is your deed bad now or is your deed bad in future? And these are all kinds of aspects, focal points that you have to think about before your research, during your research, and you have to think about it after your research when you're writing up the results. Do you do any harm to the people because you wrote the results in this way? So ethics is not just something for the last chapter or for one of the last lectures of a MOOC on quality research. No, ethics is everywhere in your study. And in the next lecture, we will see what kind of visions of ethics there are.